Um, this is a slightly unusual topic, but I hope we refer it all to uh, a business point of view. Uh, power. I have been fascinated by power since I was no age at all. I remember sitting as a child watching the earth movers when they were developing the M2 and being totally mesmerized by them. Later on, when I grew old enough to drive, on a good big stormy day, I used to drive down to Whitehead and watch the breakers and the waves hitting uh, the promenade. And it was fantastic. Um, later on, um, I raced 750 Yamahas, V8 cars, as you all appreciate. And the sound of four Merlin engines in a Lancaster bomber flying over just makes the hair rise in the back of my neck, and that's all to do with power. But the most powerful thing that I know is tiny little words put together because they can make the biggest changes in people's lives. Uh, words have been used to start wars, words have been used to seduce, words have been used to cajole, to control, and to comfort. Uh, and the trouble with words is that we take them for granted. You know, it's like breathing. We all breathe. We don't think about breathing until you get something stuck in your throat or you're underwater and all of a sudden breathing becomes terribly, terribly important. You know? uh, words are exactly the same. We don't appreciate them until uh, something unfortunate happens to us, like we have a stroke or something like that and you can't speak. Then you realize just how important words were to you. So um, don't take them for granted. My daddy was a, a fairly smart man and he wasn't somebody who gave a lot of advice, but the one piece of advice I can remember him giving me when I was young was he said, Son, he says, before you speak, you are master of your words. Once you've spoken, your words are master of you. That was very profound for an eight-year-old, I must say. But um, I think if, if a lot of couples would take that on board, it would be an awful lot more happy relationships, you know. So you have to be really careful about what you say. Um, how powerful are words? Words can direct you along a particular path, right? They can make you think in a certain way. And one of the things I'd like to show you is, um, I'd, like, I'd like to give you three levels of this. The, the bottom level, the starter level would be something like, if I make this statement to you now, Angela's apprehension rose like a ball in her throat as she approached the bank, right? What have you in your head? Worried. She's worried. Why is she worried? Because she's going to the bank. Right, okay. Uh, so Angela's going to the bank. Could somebody suggest uh, how Angela is dressed, for instance? What would she be wearing if she's going to the bank? A business suit. Or business suit, okay. What would she have in her hand? Briefcase. Briefcase, okay. So we've got this picture in your head. Angela is going to the bank, worried, dressed in a business suit, carrying a briefcase. Now what I'm going to do is take that picture and completely change it simply by adding a few words. I think it's 11 words in total. She could have started walking past the bank, of course. She could be walking past the bank, right? <laughs> so the, 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 the sentence once again was, Angela's apprehension rose like a ball in her throat as she approached the bank. I'm now going to add a few words to the start of that. And you've got, it was the first time she had piloted the barge. And Angela's apprehension rose like a ball in her throat as she approached the bank, right? So now you have a completely different picture, right? What is Angela wearing now? It certainly isn't a business suit, right? What has she got in her hand? She's got the wheel of the barge, okay? Those little words have completely changed the way you were thinking from the picture you had in your head earlier on. Now, comedians have used this to great effect for years. They take you down one particular, at least you think you're going down the right lane, and the humour comes in the fact that they show you that you're in completely the wrong direction altogether. Um, one of my, well, one of the great comedians in England, a guy called Tim Vine, I don't know if any of you know him, uh, Tim would say something like, uh, I went into a record shop the other day, and I said, have you, what have you got by the doors? He said, a bucket of sand and a fire extinguisher. <laughs> yep. Once again, takes you in the wrong way. Uh, Stephen Wright, the American comedian, is one of my favorites again. Uh, he says, he's the guy with a very deep voice, and he says, um, I went into a restaurant that serves breakfast at any time. So I ordered French toast during the Renaissance. I like it. Um, my favorite guy is the whole is Milton Jones, you know the guy with the crazy hair and the, and the flowery shirts. And he says that uh, if they make it illegal to wear the veil at work, beekeepers are going to be really annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the other one uh, he said was, uh, <laughs> hang on. Yes, uh, my mother made us eat all sorts of vitamins and supplements 
until one day I nearly choked on a portion of the Sunday Times. <laughs> and my absolute favorite one, <laughs> my absolute favorite one by Milton Jones is uh, uh, my grand we buried our grandfather last week. About a month ago we covered his back in lard. After that he went downhill very quickly. <laughs> but you see the idea, it gives you a picture in your mind and then takes you in a completely different direction. Um, so that's one level, that's a pretty basic level of the power of words. Why don't you take it up to the next level? During the 90s uh, I did a degree in Queen's University in psychology. And the thing about it is when you're doing a degree in, in psychology, uh, the students tend to be in, in sort of cajoled a press gang almost into a psychology experiments because they need people to work with and you're a captive audience. And one of the things I've learned is that whenever you're asked to partake in a psychological experiment, you can almost guarantee that what they're telling you it's about is a lie. Right? The, the real purpose is not what you're being told it is. Psychology professors basically lie. So there was a great experiment that happened uh, back in the, in, the, in the 90s, I think it was, uh, and I'd like to sort of explain it to you now, um, arbitrarily here, by, by saying I'm going to split the room into two halves. Now obviously we're not actually going to do this, but this will give you some idea what happens. Uh, so if we, t if we make this half of the room the control group, right, and this half of the room the experimental group, and what we would be doing would be, um, one at a time, you'd be coming into the next room, okay? okay? One at a time you've been into the next room, and when you're in the next room, you'd be shown 30 sets of five word groups and you'd be asked to construct a sentence from those five word groups, a coherent sentence, one that makes sense, okay? Um, and as I say, the important thing is you're going in one at a time, you're looking at these, you'd be trying to make up your five word sentences, you'd be timed, and once you've done that, uh, I'd be sending you down to Professor McWilliams' office at the other end of the corridor and she'd conduct the second experiment. Okay, I'll explain it when you get there. Right? So that's basically what we're doing. Now, the control group, um, these are, that, that's just five of your sample words, okay? So, find it, he yelled instantly. You can very quickly work that out. He found it instantly, four words. Okay, the second one uh, would be cow standing groups. Okay, the third one would be it's time to decorate. The fourth one would be uh, she needed to study. And the fifth one would be believe in free enterprise. Okay, so you get the idea out of the five. So, that, so the people from this side, one at a time, going in, doing that, being timed, and then heading down to Jennifer's office for the second experiment. The people in the other group would get these words. Okay. Uh, first one, once again, you're trying to make a four-word sentence. So it's lonely at Christmas. Uh, he forgot the marmalade or the coat. Uh, they won at bingo. Being helpless is sad, and use expensive wrinkle cream. Okay, so that's your, your five words. That would be the people in this group, one at a time. Now, can I ask you, at this point, has anybody any idea what the experiment is? What it really? Can anybody? No, anybody at all? Okay. Can anybody see the difference in the two groups of words? That one's more positive, and the next one's more negative. You're close. You're actually very close. Almost. Okay. The difference is the control group, this lot here, are what we call neutral words. There's nothing, they're just neutral. There's nothing special about them. The second one, Michaela said that the first one's more positive. It's sort of like these ones here all have at least one word in each group that has something to do with being old. Right? The first one, lonely, is associated with being old. The second one, forget. If people get forgetful when they go. Bingo is associated with old people, believe it or not. Uh, helpless and wrinkle. Okay, now, bear in mind there were 30 of these. I'm only showing you five. Okay? Having told you that, have you any idea what the experiment was? No. Okay. No. The experiment, folks, was nothing to do with how quickly you could work out the four the, the sentences. The experiment was how quickly you could walk from that room down to Jennifer's office. Right? And what they found was that the people who were exposed to the second group 
walked the corridor 12% slower wow. than the people who weren't. Right? <laughs> now, these people did not know they were being influenced, but they were being influenced just because they had been thinking about things that are associated with being old, and they walked down the corridor 12% slower. You know, so that's an effect that words can have on you with you not even knowing that it's taking place. Okay? So, uh, it's a bit scary. Oops. Now, it was called the Florida Experiment. The reason it was called the Florida Experiment, even though it took part, part, place in New York, is because Florida is known as the old state in America. It's where people go to retire. It's where people go because it's warmer and so on. So hence, it's called the Florida Experiment. It was uh, done by uh, guys called Barr, Chen and Burroughs in 1996. Um, now, one thing I'd like to say to you this, which will, will make sense in a moment. Your subconscious does not deal well with negatives. Right? So if you're saying to yourself, um, I will not eat fatty foods, your subconscious doesn't take that in. What it takes in is, I will eat fatty foods. Right? So you get the direct opposite. Sure, <laughs> <laughs> that is where you're going wrong. That is a fact. Negatives do not work in the subconscious, right? So you have to be very careful with this in your business stuff, in, in your business wording with things, right? I want to give you an example. David, you would say, we package your goods to ensure they arrive in pristine condition, right? What you wouldn't say is we package your goods to ensure they don't get damaged, right? Because what was in the people's subconscious? The goods get damaged, right? So they immediately associate the goods getting damaged with David Hall, right? So you don't use something like that. Um, Duncan, we can supply you with top quality prestige products at excellent prices. All good, right? What you wouldn't say is, we can supply you with top quality prestige products at bargain prices, or low prices, or cut prices, because those are all cheap, right? So they're not prestige products anymore. You know, excellent prices works. Uh, <laughs> Yules, uh, you know, we give you peace of mind today, knowing that you will always have top quality medical services at your call, not at your disposal. Right? Disposal is a negative word, right? Mm -hmm. The other one is, same line, uh, what you wouldn't use, we give you peace of mind today knowing you always have top quality medical services when you need them. It's very subtle, but that's a negative. You need them when you're sick. Yeah. You know, at your call is far, far better. So be careful in your advertising about what you do. Okay? Um, right. I want to move on to the next level. Uh, it's a little bit harder to explain, and I find, it, personally, I find it much more fascinating. But uh, back in the 60s, there was a guy called uh, Sarnoff Mednik who came up with a thing called the Remote Association Test. And it's very, very simple. Can anybody tell me what the connection is between three words? Jeez. Jeez. Correct. That was good. That was very good. Okay. Next one. Takes a wee bit longer. I'm thinking ship. <laughs> You're so Board. Dive board, nice. light board, rocket board, board rocket. Look at the board. Sky. Right? Sky dive, sky dive, sky rocket. Okay? And the last one is this one, and you can sit there all day and not work it out because there isn't one. Right? There's no connection with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is the remote association test. The fascinating thing about that is, right, do you think it would be possible for you to feel that you know whether there's a solution or not before you actually know the solution, right? In other words, could you have looked, I mean, you were all very, very quick at getting the cottage, the Swiss and the cake, right? That came through very quickly. It took a lot longer for the other one, the next one, and to say there is no solution in the third one. But psychologists decided back uh, in the 90s again, is it's possible for you to actually feel that, you, some people call it intuition, that there is a solution without actually knowing what the solution is, yeah. okay? And the reason that this is pertinent to ourselves here from a business point of view is that if you can do this, there's a sense of positiveness and happiness about being able to do it. Um, several teams of German psychologists did studies on this and it's called cognitive ease, okay? 
And basically what happens is uh, whenever you get the feeling that there is a solution, if you were able to, which they could do in a lab, but couldn't do it here, they can monitor your facial expression, they can monitor your muscular, uh, the, 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 the firing of the muscles. There's a slight, tiny, the beginnings of a smile starts in the faces of people as they realize they're starting to do it. Now, it's not a big grin, it's just a, it's a feeling of satisfaction, a feeling of happiness, for want of a better way of doing it. So they actually did an experiment, and they got people in the room, and they showed them a series of these triads, okay, some of which worked, and some of which had a solution, other which didn't. But what they did was they asked them to push a button, uh, and they only gave them two seconds to push a button to say, yes, there's a solution, or no, there's no solution. And they gave them two seconds to make the decision. Two seconds was far too short, <coughs> okay, to make a decision. There's no way they could have actually worked it out. And what they found was that the results were much better than chance. Chance should be 50-50, the results were far better than chance. So people were actually able to work out that there was a solution before they had any idea what the solution was. Right? Now, I find that quite impressive, right? Because I know Ernie's looking very puzzled here. Because it, it sounds daft, but it's actually true, right? Uh, they were far more accurate than pure chance. Now, as I say, whenever you do work this out, you can have, there's this nice of, there's this sense of, it's sense of cognitive ease. It's basically generated by a very, very faint signal from the brain's associative ability, which knows that the three words are coherent, coherent right? Long before the association is triggered. Now, it isn't pure gut, it's actually associative memory. It's going back into your past and your brain's working it out for you before you even know it yourself, right? And you feel better about it. How does this apply to business? Okay, well, it's a wee bit more difficult than, that, than the last one. Um, in working <coughs> on this last night, I could only come up with one situation which I thought was very pertinent, okay? And it, uh, how does it work? With Fiona, right? Say you were saying, you could say in your advertising, be assured that your portrait will reflect, reflect the esteem of your family. Three big words in there. There's the, tri the triads there, it's very simple. And the word self. Self-assured, self-corporate, self-esteem. You know? So what actually happens if somebody reads that, there's an immediately a feeling of, ah, that's nice. <laughs> you know? And they're immediately more inclined to like what you're trying to tell them. You know? mm -hmm. That's just one small example of how it can work. So that is how we can all be affected by words without knowing that we're being affected at all. We have no control over it. You know, advertisers have known this for years, right? Uh, we can't control it, it just happens. And there are great instances where words can make you do things you'd never think twice about doing it in other times. Nothing to do with hypnosis, it's just a straightforward fact of human nature. So that's it, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to leave you with one last quote from a guy called Robert Greene who wrote The 48 Laws of Power. He says, the human tongue is a beast that few can master. It strains constantly to break out of its cage, and if it's not tamed, it will turn wild and cause you grief. And that is very, very true. true. So I hope you enjoyed it, folks. That's it.